neat lessons you can do in your classroom that help you bring home what it is that, you know, the space missions are all about. We basically just did a lot of hands-on interactive activities with the NASA engineers to just help us bring it home to our students. Hi everyone, this is Rico Figliolini, host of Peachtree Corner's Life, but we have the Ed Hour today, and I'm with host Alan Kaplan, yes. and it's, yeah, okay. there's a there's a seven second delay on these things, we got it. We but got we're it. here, yes, <laughs> gotta love it. So by way of introduction, we are in a technology <laughs> hub here in the city of Peachtree Corner's, and we're actually doing this podcast from Atlanta Tech Park in the city of Peachtree Corners at Tech Park Atlanta. It's actually along the road of the autonomous vehicle track that's known as Curiosity Lab at Peachtree Corners. It's a place that we have, this this area is 5G, Sprint 5G compatible now, uh, throughout this whole Tech Park. And that's the reason why this will be a hub for autonomous vehicles and smart city work through this live living lab because Self-driving cars can come through this place where people are crossing roads, where there's street lights, where everything is an active, real-life community. So look out for those uh, <laughs> those those autonomous vehicles. But uh, we're working out of this uh, podcast room here, and I appreciate Atlanta Tech Park for providing this to us. So, Alan, tell us a little bit about the Ed Hour. Sure. Uh, Rico, it's great to be back with you here on yeah, the Ed Hour. it is. Uh, yeah. And uh, excited uh, for those of you rejoining us, and if you're – viewing our show here for the first time. The purpose of the Ed Hour is to open the doors of our schools to the community so that the community can see the wonderful things that are happening there, the accomplishments of our teachers, the great things our students are doing, and uh, the wonderful things happening in our schools every day. So glad to be able to bring this back to you. We have a special guest today, too, a teacher from Paul Duke STEM High School. She's a computer science teacher. Yeah. She had a great experience during the summer. We'll let her explain that. But this is one of the reasons why she's here, because it ties in so well to Paul Duke STEM High School. So, Becky Fisher, I appreciate you uh, coming on the show. Thank you. I was uh, looking online one day because uh, I'm very interested in getting a Raspberry Pi yeah. lab going at my school. And I was trying to find some ways that we could do like a coding club with Raspberry Pis. So I found out that they have this competition with Raspberry Pis on the space station, actually. But the competition is only eligible in some countries in Europe. So I was really disappointed that I wasn't able to get involved with that. But they actually do experiments since they run code um, on these Raspberry Pis on the space station that students do. So in looking into this further, I just on a whim, it was, you know, close to the deadline, um, to apply for this, I just said, hmm, let me just try this out and let me apply for this uh, NASA experience. And about two weeks later, I was accepted. And I was just like beside myself because apparently there was over 500 applicants and they take 50 each summer. So being a computer science teacher, this was kind of newly opened up to computer science teachers. It's usually um, a lot of more science teachers that are doing it because they learn about all the ways that the science field is being used in NASA. But they're opening it up more to the math teachers and computer science. And so I got accepted and I was able to bring back a lot to all the fields at my school. And I actually have um, stuff to share with some of the other teachers. Awesome. Well, Becky, so we're eager to learn about your experience there. First, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you uh, and, and leading up to this. So you're a computer science teacher at Paul Duke. Can you tell us a little bit how you got involved in your, your background in computer science before being at Paul Duke and just kind of share that with us? I've always been really good with math and logic, and I wanted to go into computers. I originally went into the Navy out of high school, and I wanted to go into the computer field, but it just wasn't a high need field at the time. It wasn't highly sought after. So I had to go in, you know, as a undesignated job, but eventually I got out and I went back to school and got a degree in computer science. And I was a programmer for a while. I ended up becoming a teacher later in life at age 33. I got into teaching through the alternative program um, to teach mathematics. I taught math for 11 years, and a couple of years ago, Dr. Weatherington, uh, the principal at Paul Duke, reached out to me and said he needed a computer science teacher, and I was over the moon excited about that. To be able to teach computer science full-time was uh, a great opportunity that I couldn't pass up, so 
here I am. And um, I love it at Paul Duke. It's amazing. Jonathan's been able to get quite a few teachers over that are really, really good. And think the students really are making good use of that. Yes. In fact, uh, 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 Jonathan was our first guest on the Ed Hour, so we're glad mm -hmm. to be able to kick it off with him. Mm -hmm. and yep. Glad to continue uh, to discuss some of the great things that are happening at Paul Duke. Yeah. So, so how many? So you're teaching computer science right now. Which, for those people that, what does that mean? You're teaching computer programming. Oh, what are you teaching? So many fields. Um, we have actually five teachers at our school that are certified in computer science education. And that is a certification that's kind of fairly new to Georgia. Mm -hmm. And so they're, um, they're hard to find, but we have, that's one of our main focuses. So mm -hmm. we have several pathways. We have cybersecurity, we have game design. We have, um, I teach the AP computer science pathway. Okay. So my students are learning mostly the programming. We would like to offer web development and Internet of Things, mm -hmm. which is, you know, goes wrong, along with the automated cars. I also run a VEX Robotics Club after school. I'm the sponsor for the VEX Robotics. <laughs> but we have, there's so much potential as the school grows because right now it's about, you know, the demand as far as how many students are interested in taking the classes, then we will offer them. But, you know, with the small number of upper level kids at the time, Right. We don't have all the offerings, but I expect that we will be able to offer all the fields of computer science. And when you're talking about programming, I'm just curious, what type of programming, which languages are you teaching? Inside? So there's no. two different AP computer science classes. One is just a general knowledge. They just have to understand the logic. And mm -hmm. um, we teach it with Scratch first, okay. and then we go right. into some Java. And um, we have an intro class where we use Scratch and Python. The third level AP computer science class is all Java. They are programming in um, Java from day one, every single day in class. So there's actually two levels of AP computer science now. Do you see kids coming, continuing on to school after that, like higher level? Or do you see the kids wanting to maybe, it may be too early, but get certified in programming and language and then move in right into the field? I do. I think we've got some kids that are really capable of, taking it to that level. And I mean, you know, we haven't had any graduating class yet, so it's right. hard to say. Sure. And in the higher level AP computer science class, the one that's the Java, there's only 14 students in there. And I think only 10 of those are seniors, but they all seem like they're very eager to go into computer. Some of them are into the robotics as well, but robotics involves programming too. It, you know, it involves all the engineering, the physics and programming. So these kids are definitely going somewhere with computer science in some way or STEM in general. Yeah. Now y'all are also, uh, I believe, teaching uh, cybersecurity uh, yes. as well. Can you talk a little bit about that at Paul Duke? Yes, we have a computer uh, a cybersecurity pathway and Philip Peavy is teaching that pathway. It's um, definitely had a big interest this year. There was four sections of it because the students were very eager to do it. They also have a um, competition, Cyber Patriots. They compete to try to find all the vulnerabilities in a system, like all the different systems, Linux, Windows, um, server. These kids are learning how to safeguard networks and the operating systems, making sure that you know the users have their strong passwords and just all the things that they need to know about keeping a system secure and we have a whole cybersecurity lab that is in the works and the kids the students will be able to actually try to keep a, a virtual system secure with like they have like a secure like a home security system set up in there hmm. and they'll be able to make sure that, that all those pieces are not vulnerable to attacks the real life yes. real life applications yes there's a real big interest hmm. for that we also have a select few students that are seniors this year that are taking courses with Mercer University and that's right the FBI I think. yes along with the FBI and they're getting uh, two college credits this year um, by working with Mercer and that's about as much as I can tell you about that but I know that they're right. doing that on Fridays and um, it's pretty tough it's pretty rigorous and you guys also have Paul Duke also has 3d printers I'm sure that's Lots of programming that goes into that as well. Yes, we have, oh gosh, we have lots. We have laser cutters and lots of printing capabilities. A lot of this equipment is still, you know, in the process of learning how to use it and getting students trained on how to um, use it. But we definitely have the capabilities to produce a lot of um, things for the community. Mm -hmm. and and have you all uh, had any corporate 
uh, sponsorships or partnerships with some of these programs, like either cybersecurity or uh, any others, or is that something you're... That's, I'm not aware of that right now. It does sound like a good opportunity, though, for mm -hmm. corporations involved in this field, for like sure. cybersecurity, to be able to uh, engage mm -hmm. as the FBI has, you know, our young minds. And, uh, I mean, there are all sorts of companies. You have Simply Safe out there selling home safety security systems. Mm -hmm. could be should be a sponsor of a STEM school, a program that, that helps protect from hacking, mm -hmm. uh, all so, sorts of IoT type stuff. So for any of you listening yeah. that are in maybe work for some of those companies, uh, maybe spread the word there because, uh, you know, this is the future of uh, your industries being trained here at Paul Duke High School. So I uh, would love to see more of those partnerships come into the school. Yeah. Yeah. And our students also are required to do internships their senior year. So if any of those companies are looking for you know, to get some students out there and get trained and get some of that um, requirement that they need from our school, then yeah. we would love that too. And I think the way that's being handled is that they're being interviewed. So they're not just, corporations can actually interview students to see if they match up with their programs and stuff, is the way I thought it was being I'm done. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so, but, so you've been, you know, science is a big thing for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, are your kids into that too, by the way? Just curious. My, I have a son that's 25, and he is a computer programmer. Okay. He graduated from Georgia Southern, and he was hired by AT&T right out of college. He actually did internships the two summers before he graduated. So, yeah, it's definitely a field that is, is hot. I mean, programming and cybersecurity both are highly sought after. Um, I also have a daughter that's a senior. She's in my programming class, and she's really, really good at it. But she wants to do early education, so mm -hmm. you know you gotta let your kids do what they want. Sure, sure. Um, and um, well, it, it's still found its path <laughs> for you, right? Uh, in, yeah, in, <laughs> yeah. She says she'll probably still do like some after-school coding to kind of get the early kids, which I think is important. I mean, kids need to learn the logic of programming at an early age. I think kindergartners yeah. can learn how to start coding and just understanding the the problem-solving process of it. And, you know, if she got into teaching the early kids and, you know, I think actually in Georgia, they're trying to push it from K through 12 right. to have it part of their curriculum to learn some of the standards of computer science, not just programming, but just being technology savvy, you know, but understand how to, you know, work your way on a computer and understand how to keep it safe. You know, yeah. and, and there's also another thing they're doing, too instead of language being French or German or Spanish, they're talking about putting computer language as a language. It is, and that's actually right? what my daughter is yeah. doing. Okay. She, that's nice. her foreign language. Is that her foreign language? I mean, there you go. School. Yeah. Because, I mean, really, do we need someone learning, you know, speaking French if they could do, take that same credit for doing computer programming? I mean, if that's what they want, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, you know, my fourth grader at, uh, at Peachtree Elementary, He's on robotics team there, and he's on a, yeah. another team that assists with technology in the school. It's called the SWAT team, students working at technology or something like okay. that. And, okay. and uh, so I'm glad to see that at the elementary school level, they're, they're, they're doing more today than even two years oh, ago yeah. in terms of engaging kids in technology into robotics. And oh, Well, uh, even doing like, I mean, they're doing PowerPoint presentations. Where you didn't see that yes. until like the end of middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. sure. They're doing that in elementary school. Right, my son just showed me one last night. Did and, he? and I was like, son, how do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? And then Photoshop, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, with. Uh, it's shifted down. <laughs> They're learning way more at a, such a small age. <laughs> so, so, but yeah. well, you know, Becky. So let's 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 maybe get into uh, your experience here over at NASA. It sounds like an amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it was a very selective program with just ten percent of the applicants getting accepted. And as you and I were chatting a little bit earlier, uh, I believe you said traditionally yeah, applicants for this program came out of Texas. Primarily, and there there was very few of any from from Georgia. So, kind of tell us a little bit more about ultimately how you had the edge there to, to get in, and uh, and then what your experiences were once once you got there. Yeah, I definitely would like to see more teachers from Georgia to apply for next year because it is absolutely incredible. They treated us pretty much like royalty. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it was exhausting because we were busy from. The moment we got there um, Sunday at lunchtime until Friday night, it was nonstop. I went to bed tired every night and had to get up early the next morning, but we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner provided every day. We had really nice dinners. It was a grant, so the hotel was paid for, the, um, the whole experience was paid for. 
Uh, but being from Georgia, I just had to get, you know, my flight paid for. It was, it was way more than I ever expected when I, you know, got to meet some of the most incredible people that were involved in the Apollo 11. And I got to meet Fred Hayes. He was one of the astronauts on the famous Apollo 13 that almost yeah. didn't make it. <laughs> he was amazing. And uh, one of the men that was one of the engineers for all the Apollo missions, um, just giving us his take on being behind the scenes and what it took to um, make those flights successful. We got to talk with lots of engineers from NASA and they showed us, we did a lot of cute lessons that, uh, I don't know, maybe cute's not the right thing, but there are some really neat lessons you can do in your classroom that help you bring home what it is that, you know, the space missions are all about and, um, you know, how we are sending robots to Mars and how we can take pictures of Mars and determine if there is like water and if there's wind and just by the, just by the images, we were able to decide, you know, was this a volcanic situation? Was this wind that caused this? We also did this really fun activity, which one of our science teachers at my school was doing just recently. We had to design these little packages, basically like if you're trying to land a robot on Mars, but you had to build something with just the right weight and design so that we could fly a drone and mm. lay it in a particular location. Because when we send those robots to Mars, we want it to go in a certain spot location. You know, you've got to land it safely. You want it in a particular spot because there's different, you know, way, places that we want to explore. So in our activity, we not only had to design this package that would um, land safely, but then we had to fly the drone and land it in that spot, which <sighs> flying those drones was not my thing. I definitely had to pass that on to my partner, but <laughs> the building was pretty full. We basically just did a lot of hands-on interactive activities with the NASA engineers to just help us bring it home to our students so that they um, understand it better. And I'm definitely happy to share. I have all the lesson plans that we got for the week and been sharing with some of our science teachers. And then there's also the computer science that goes in with it as far as we did some makey-makey, these -makey, little devices that you can um, have interactive touch and it can, um, you know, identify parts of something like parts of a body or whatever. So um, just really neat little activities to bring home, but mostly being behind the scenes, being at Johnson Space Center, being in the mission control and watching the space station live while sitting mm -hmm. in uh, mission <clears throat> control. We, in the past, apparently they would take them to the old uh, Apollo mission control, and they would actually get to tour that. But right. because this was our 50th anniversary, they were remodeling it to yeah. look like it used to. Yeah, so we didn't get to go to the mission control that they used for the Apollo missions. Um, I was kind of sad by that, but it was also neat that, you know, that was the reason that they were doing it. Um, so, so what, of what you learned there, in addition to the lessons, what, what surprised you or something that you didn't know about NASA <laughs> or something that had occurred. You're probably going to laugh maybe a couple at me, of those things. but I really never <sighs> thought that going to Mars was really something that was happening. I just, I honestly thought that was a joke that we're trying to get to Mars, but we really are. We are really trying to get to Mars. And I was <laughs> um, really surprised by that. I learned about a lot of the strategies that they're looking at and how they're going to put a station that's going to revolve around the moon right. and then that's going the to be like a temporary you yeah. know, refueling and mm -hmm. everything and how long it's going to take to get there. And it was really fascinating. And that, you know, I learned about all the different robots that have been placed on Mars and why they're there. And, you know, um, in fact, I, I think was, just, uh, I think it was yesterday saw a news article where they had oxygen levels that were unexpected on Mars, that, that there were some tests that they had gotten back mm -hmm. and there was a spike in oxygen levels where they didn't expect to, to see it oh, on man. Mars. So. The, the different landers have different missions mm -hmm. too, right? So some of them dig, like the last one I think they sent actually dig, dug into the soil to be able mm -hmm. to take samples. But so every mission has a different, different mission to be able to, different science to be able to do that. Yeah, and I think according to the article, it was the Curiosity rover that found 
unexplained oxygen on Mars. So hopefully we'll explain it. But, uh, so the mystery continues, and hopefully in our yeah. lifetime. And in fact, if you get oh. an indication, if, if in our lifetime, yeah. where, where we thought that. I mean, if Elon Musk has any, where, where, <laughs> where they're all, we're, we're gonna we're, we're gonna be able to you know go there in about five years. So he's he's already planning a a tourism mission to the moon within a year, right? So I mean, we need more people like Elon Musk. <laughs> so, um, from being there, what's your perspective? Either in some, one of us being, you know, someone being on the moon in our lifetime or being on Mars. Do you think uh, did I, you get? Apparently, we are going back to the moon in 2024. I think that's the mm -hmm. yeah. Help that's me do that's the, the goal. Here. Yeah, that's the goal. Twenty twenty four. That's this is what Donald Trump set set as the as the mission for NASA program to be yeah, there. Yeah, I heard it from some of the engineers at NASA that twenty twenty four is yeah. our goal to get back to the moon. Yeah. And um, they actually, I saw the um, it's called the Orion that they've designed, and it's going to be a capsule very similar to what they used to use, I guess, in Apollo missions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, pyramid but roundish but uh, it's going to go and land back in the ocean again right. so like the old way but it's they have a replica of one in the museum that we went to basically the museum that we went to has all the parts of the international space center in there um not put together exactly like the space station but they have replicas of each um, compartment so that the astronauts can train and get a feel for what it's like uh -huh. and so there was um, the Orion, which I guess that's how you say it, O-R-I-O-N. I may be saying it wrong, but that is I think, I think you're right, Orion. Okay. That's Orion. Orion. Orion? Orion is the way you okay. pronounce it. All right. So, yeah, I'm not good with my um, pronunciations here. Mm. But um, that's the model that they are designing that's going to go back to the moon. And, and did they indicate when they thought we would have a man or woman on, on Mars? On Mars. Mm. Anyone? I don't remember I don't. hearing an actual. You know, um, I'm suspecting we'll be I, on I, I, time. I, I think I think NASA's mission right now is to get to the moon first, mm -hmm. use the, get, the gateway, the which is like the space going. station that orbits the moon, get them to land on the moon, and then eventually hop to Mars, which yeah. is what six, I forget if six or eight month travel yeah. to wow. Mars is what wow. it is, in deep space. Yeah. So away from our magnetic system of the Earth, so you're. You could be shot blasted with solar wind from the sun and all sorts of nasty stuff going on. Yeah. But uh, again, if Elon Musk had his way, with the moon, we'd be there in about six years. And, and to the moon, we'd have like the old take the rockets from the 50s sci-fi movies and just land it on the moon like that yeah. and take it back off. That's what he wants to do wow. with his starship. Well, and, and so back to our students at Paul Duke yeah. and uh, among our other schools, in particular our STEM yeah. schools, it'll be, you know, then maybe that generation that in their lifetime sees the reality of today's dreams, so of, of, of being on Mars. Uh, so, with everything going on. I mean, sure. when you spoke to, the, like, the astronauts, right, the, the guys that have been out there, and every time I hear an interview from one of them, or I... I uh, read one of the books from one of the guys. Forget the guy that does the, the guitar thing. Was he there? Yes, he, he was hilarious. <laughs> yes, he's a funny. You got to see some of the yes, YouTube videos um, with him. What's his name? I can't recall his name right now. Um, yes. he, he had some really great insights. He's the one, he was the engineer for the Apollo missions. Um, if you find I'm sorry. Maybe. There's so many talented people that you would not think – you know, the, when people stereotype these engineers as white-shirted people, but, you know, they're the white shirt, white guy maybe being the... Jerry the, Whitfield. Yes, that was the guy, I think. Yeah. But there's so many talented people. There's such a diversity of, of people that work for the space program. But did they share any insight with you that things that they, that, you know, you might not have realized up in space? Um, well, there was one engineer that believes that we are going to be able to find a cure for cancer in space in our lifetime. I don't know how that's exactly okay. happening, but with some of the tests and stuff that they're doing up there, they believe that they will be able to find a, a cure for cancer Happy. in our lifetime. But, so. yeah. Okay. It was it's so much information. Like I was blown away with the things that, that I learned that I honestly had no no idea that was actually going on with NASA. You know, I just thought we were just exploring space. But um, and then I, you know, learned about the 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 twin that went up in space, and then they compared yes. his 
the, oh. the two brothers. Yeah, I can't remember his name, but uh, a lot of the teachers that were there had already heard about it. Um, unfortunately, I had not. But now I've been watching um, that Mars series on Netflix. And yes. I'm starting to learn more about it yes. now. And it's very interesting. So they compared the impact to the, to the body. And, yes, uh, and apparently yeah. his DNA actually changed. Wow. Yeah. To a like it was just it's almost like crazy. evolution right it was evolving to be yes. <laughs> to be able to stay in space eventually his, it was back to normal after a while but when yes. he first came home his dna had actually changed so very interesting the things that they learned I from that this. he got taller too but then he shrunk when he arrived that way after a few weeks he shrunk well, i'm shrinking his, but this just stupid i'm getting uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't we all <laughs> Yeah. Wow. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize that being up in space all that time without the gravity that mm -hmm. when you come back, you can't even walk, you know, that they yeah. just pretty much have to carry you off your ship and until you can yeah. get yourself back to, yeah. you know. And even clothes yeah, because of the weightlessness. When you're back on Earth, you're feeling the fabric rubbing against your skin wow. is supposed to be really more sensitive mm. uh, to that type of thing. You know, I cool. mean, but, but the whole evolution piece, that's, that's interesting, right? Yeah. You think a thousand years from now, right, uh, yeah. when, when living elsewhere besides Earth is a reality, whether it be yeah. the moon or Mars or wherever yeah. else, that the um, DNA can change in that short period of time, really that's how right. it actually evolves when you're living your whole so, life in space. So, so imagine you go to Mars, you're a colonist, you're there 15 years, and then you come back. Are you a Martian? Does your DNA change? You know, how, how does that work? Yeah. So yes. so what did you tell your kids? I mean, were you able to share some of that stuff with, with them? How, how, how does I that tried. work? I tried. They, um, you know, some of them were like, oh, wow, that's cool. But I, I don't think that they realize the impact that it really has to be able to go there and to be behind the scenes with all that. So, yeah, I didn't quite get the enthusiasm from the, the kids as much as I do from most of the adults that mm. um, found out that I was going. The, re the rest of us geeks. That, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but were you able to then apply maybe some of the stir stuff that you learned? I mean, you, you applied some of it with... In different so things, a lot though. of the stuff that we learned is really geared more towards the sciences, the physics and the chemistry and, you know, some of the engineering classes. So I have shared that stuff. I have a teacher who teaches the earth or she teaches environmental science. And I was able to share with her the whole lesson plan with being able to identify the images from Mars and matching up what type of, you know, weather or, you know, whatever might have caused it land formations um and of course the physics teacher she was like asking me she's like so we're doing this thing about mars is there something that you learned about that oh my gosh you got to do this drones and we have a whole drones team yeah and they go and compete so one of the guys that's really good with flying the drones is helping her out with you know flying the drones for the little pieces that they're building and you know trying to get it on the target there are definitely some more things that I would like to implement in my class, probably more next semester, as far as my computer science class, because the makey makey, the more hands on programming, I, you know, with me being the sponsor for the VEX Robotics, and we also have a first um, robotics team as well. When I went to the museum with the ISS and there, they have a whole section with the replicas of the robots and stuff. And, uh, the kid that was giving us a tour was a 20 year old kid who was on a first robotics team when he was in high school and he's just interning there. I knew he was so young. I was like, you're really right out of high school, aren't you? And then he, I said, did you do robotics in high school? Cause he was like, so into these and he's like, yeah, I did first robotics and they actually have a first robotics set up inside that ISS museum, but he has one of his robots in there. On display, it's um, something that he won a first place prize when he was in high school, like a little spider bot. So oh. it was neat that, to talk to this kid who was, you know, just 20 years old, still in college and interning there and giving us a tour. I also met somebody at the, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab who was also in fresh, like in his young 20s or whatever. And I was asking him and he's a, a scuba diver. And so I'm scuba diver certified too. my husband has mm -hmm. done it for like 20 years. And so I went and secretly got certified a couple of, or three years ago <laughs> so that we could do it together. So when we went to the neutral buoyancy lab, I was like, Oh, this is so cool. Cause you have all these, like for every astronaut, they have to have five scuba divers assigned to each astronaut that gets right. down there to keep them, you know, just to make sure that, I don't know, just whatever they have to do to make sure. And, but to even just put the astronauts in there because the suit itself weighs so much which is mm. something i didn't realize either they have to have a crane 
to put them down into the water. Yeah. And then there they have like a replica of this International Space Center in that big pool. So that was something that I found interesting that, you know, you could just go in there as a scuba diver and be helping hmm. the astronauts. My daughter also is, she's 17 and she got certified along with me too. So I was like, you got NASA and help the astronauts. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah I'm, so, I'm going to go home today and, and tell my uh, <laughs> uh, nine-year-old son, you know, that's in robotics now. So see, you, you, you stay with this mm -hmm. and you could be that intern over at NASA or, or, or something else. So right. Um, and I also found yeah. out that there were teachers who had done this program, and then they ended up getting hired to go work there. There was there was one teacher that was giving us a tour. And he had done the program mm -hmm. before, and then he had not interested, and he applied, and now he's working at NASA. So. Mm -hmm. And then I think we talked about this earlier. I think there's a you know one of the graduates of Norcross High School works for SpaceX. Work, exactly. Yeah, worked for SpaceX. Yeah, yeah. she was on the. Um, marching band yeah. i think we did a story on some of where are these kids from the marching band mm -hmm. uh and that's where she went she went nice. to spacex nice you know and, and and i would even say you know to any of the students that should happen upon this podcast is just mm -hmm. you know kind of listen to what's being what you're hearing today because you're sitting in a classroom at high school now whether it's paul duke or north cross or another high school mm -hmm. and this is you potentially in just a few years should you want to go that path so it's certainly within your your reach and your grasp and it sounds like at, at paul duke and, and and the other schools there's the tools there to educate you for tomorrow's workforce to be able to go in that direction if that's what interests yeah. you. yeah i mean with with the things that becky has been sharing with us today i mean drones robotics, programming, all that stuff goes into that, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're talking about, forget about the biodiversity, all the things that go into taking us to the moon and even taking us to Mars, how, how physically your body can be traumatized in a, in a journey like that. And mm -hmm. so biology and medicine, it's all, all part and parcel. You don't have to be a, a, an astronaut or rocket scientist. Did you know that the state of Georgia actually has a spaceport? in Camden County, that they've tried to, they have a budget there and we have some sort of, I guess the state has some sort of space bureau or something, but <laughs> but Camden County is trying to be the spaceport of Georgia. It's wow. located near the coast and they want to be able to get rockets shooting off there. So can you imagine, I mean, every state wants to be able to have their own spaceport and their own space technology. Sure. We I mean, also have to have like yeah. dietitians, you know, yeah. um, food, horticulture, all that. I mean, because we have to be able to grow plants and grow our own food if we're going to be up there for a long time. Right. And, and even like you said before, if we're going to find the cure to cancer, how are they going to do that without a biologist, a chemist, or mm -hmm. a physician being up there? That's why the crew tends to be a variety of mm -hmm. people, right? Military, mm -hmm. physicians, biologists, teacher. I think we had to teach a couple of teachers up there at one point. So mm -hmm. maybe you could be a teacher going up there at some point. That's not um, that. Yeah. Not for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting up there. It's I would think it's exciting up there, but uh, but I'd love to do a lot of behind the scenes down here. Yeah. yeah, that'd be okay. Yeah. But no. Did I'll they talk? Around. Did they talk about what they expect students? What type of students they would like to see? Uh, they want a variety. I mean, they want all kinds of, I mean, so many skill sets that are involved in the whole thing. I mean, it's it's all about our way of life. I mean, our, how we survive. It, it takes everything. I had a, there, there was a slide that I saw um, recently that I was looking at, and it had all the different job fields that are needed. And it's just so many that you wouldn't even expect that NASA needs. The, the list is endless. Really? Yeah. So it's not just scientists yeah it's amazing what um you know what you actually did according to this you did some augmented reality too i was going to ask you about that how was that oh yes the, i forgot that was one of yeah. my favorite things we actually they have this simulated lab where you're trying to it's called mission to moon and mission to mars and it's kind of almost like an escape room kind of situation mm -hmm. where Everybody has a role, and I was in charge of the robots, of course. That's the one I picked. And we had to switch. So I was at first, I was in the, the command center, and I was having to give directions to the people who were operating the robots on the ship. But you had the people that were, you know, testing this or that. And we had these manuals that we had to follow. And if something happened, we had to look at the manual to see, you know, how to handle that situation. And everything was critical, it was timely. Mm -hmm. 
It was tent. It was intense, but um, it was fun. I mean, it was like a nice little escape room. And then we had to switch, and the ones who were in the command center ended up on the ship. And then you know we swapped roles, and so I got to try to operate these robotic arms to try to do these little test tubes because there was these things that I can't. You know, you have to use the robotic arms because you can't. You have to keep that environment clean. So you're having to do these controls to get these test tubes and do this and that and it was not easy and they're giving us instructions on what to do. And I'm like, Oh, okay, well, how am I going to get this to work? And but it was fun. It was just, it was such um, a neat team building activity. Yeah. That was probably my favorite part. And I have got, I've done a lot of researching on um, how to do different escape rooms, like digitally and mm -hmm. physically. And I, when I have the time, I want to put one together for my own students to try to bring home the knowledge. That, that would be cool to yes. put together that. I've, I've been in a couple of escape rooms, and yes. they don't sound fun until you actually get into them, mm -hmm. and then you realize how fun they are. I've done one that's just a plain digital one, like a website digital uh, breakout, mm -hmm. and that was pretty successful. But I've bought some lock boxes and different ty types of locks and um, mm -hmm. like the invisible ink with the fluorescent lights and mm -hmm. Um, so I really would like to try to make my own escape room. Too. Yeah, one of the best ways to help make sure a child's learning yes. is to, to yes. capture their imagination, right? And, 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 uh, an interest. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good job. Well, so it sounds like, uh, that the enthusiasm that, that you gained from being there is really translated back to, to your classroom, to your, mm -hmm. to your students. Yeah. So what's 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 next for you? What what uh, new experience for you, or is there an opportunity to stay engaged either to, through some type of programming with NASA? Is there any opportunity to? They do have a alumni get, that I could apply for. I think they go to Florida for the alumni one. But this past summer, I did two two weeks of professional development here at home, and then I did a professional development in Houston with NASA. And I also did a professional development with Stanford University. Yeah. So my summer was really <laughs> busy this last summer. So I kind of promised my husband that, and plus I got married. We had two vacations and I got married. Um, it was a really, really busy summer. It was great and it was fun and I learned so much. But um, this next summer, I think I'm going to take a break. But I would love to see other teachers apply for it and see more representation from Georgia. So the application is currently open. We could um, probably post oh, cool. the link to the yeah, uh, I can share 2020. It I can put it into the uh, show notes on yeah. this. Yeah. So, and I believe the deadline is March 2nd to apply for the 2020 summer if other teachers are interested in plenty, plenty of time. Mm -hmm. And for those adults that would like to go or the teenage kids or even middle school kids, there's something called Space Camp in Florida in, in the um, – Orlando-based uh, NASA program. So you can go there for a week and sleep over, and it's run by NASA. It's actually, I'm sorry, in Huntsville, Alabama, at their facilities. And actually, my son yeah. and, and I were there um, for, I think, just a weekend with, with Cub Scouts. Oh, were they? Uh, okay. So it was, a, it was yeah. a great opportunity, but nothing I'm sure. Nothing like what you had the opportunity no. to experience. Yeah. You, were, you were really behind the scenes. We were just yeah. kind of there with this camp, but uh, what you got to experience there was – was well beyond uh, the, answering the question of how do astronauts go to the restroom in space. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what's the most common answer? That's, a, that's question? a fun question to ask. Right. Well, that, you know, if, if there's one question. It's I a potty ask, question. Everyone well, wants a potty question. It's, it's the question I hear asked. Not, you know, if someone's talking about it, I wonder, or, or if they're asking someone related, that's always the question. But you had so much more insight into what's going on there. So, for example, you know, make the food production. How do they make the food and what goes into that? And, yeah. Um, uh, and they also, when it, we went to the food lab, they talked about how they have to try to spice it up because a lot of the food is so flavorless. And mm -hmm. these, uh, the astronauts just, you know, they really want some more flavor. And so, they're, you know, it's, it's See, there's, there's yeah. another job. Yeah. I, I would That's volunteer right. for it to That's be a right. food taster huh? for, for, for the there food. <laughs> <laughs> no, not allergies, please. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. So, it, you know, I, I think a great benefit again is you being able to come back in addition to what you shared to be able to share these stories with your students to really engage them and, and get them interested in in, in the subject areas that, that you teach that are directly related to, to mm -hmm. your experience yeah uh, any feedback from your students or what and when you brought this back to your to your students what what were their reactions and, and what you saw what you shared i think our students at 
quality STEM are just, they're so eager to learn so much. They get, they, they go above and beyond. Whenever we show them something, they, they take it and they have done some amazing stuff. I have a, I'm trying to build a Raspberry Pi lab and I have some kids that come in after school. I actually had a girl that wanted to take one home today. They explain for those that aren't, aren't familiar with computers <laughs> what Raspberry Pi is. I'm sorry, I forget about that. Okay, so Raspberry Pi is a small $35 computer. It's all the operating system and storage is on a tiny little SIM card, and but it can operate on its own. So if you want to um, program some in the Internet of Things or like a um, animatronic or something that you want mechanical or lights or anything that you want to be standalone, but you don't want to have to have a whole computer hooked up to it, you can program with the Raspberry Pi all kinds of sensors. You have cameras and lights and motion. So the students are coming to the lab and learning how they can program it to respond to either a button press or a motion sensor or you know, make a buzzer go off if the, something goes by. I recently got a scanner and a fingerprint scanner, so we're going to learn how to program the fingerprint scanner. But there's so many capabilities with the, the Raspberry Pi itself because it's just a tiny little computer that you can connect to Internet of Things to have like a project that doesn't have to have a whole computer with it. And it's relatively inexpensive. So my kids are pretty much, my students are learning what they can do with this Raspberry Pi and just trying different DIYs that they find on the internet. We recently put together a Google, what do you call it? Like a Google assistant. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. a little cardboard one, but it's got the Raspberry Pi inside. It's got a little microphone and speaker and that you needs. can say, Hey Google. And it yeah. responds just like yes. a Google assistant. Wow. So they actually put this together and made it. And so the girl that wanted to take it home, she took that home today so she could continue playing with it over the Thanksgiving break. But these kids are coming up with some amazing stuff. We have this Grinch production happening. I don't know if you've heard the about Grinch, that. The Grinch, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. The um, play. We have our right. mechatronics that is working with the dance and theater to make it. Honestly, I haven't seen all the behind the scenes yet, but it's going to be fascinating. Just the, the capabilities that um, we have to explore with things and the, the equipment that we have to be able to make things and create and just go beyond where what do you want to call it their creativity and mm -hmm. expertise and that's going to be incorporated into the production the um yes the grinch will have some like, Te technical, technical technical <laughs> technical surprises yes, yes. yes. yeah but it's, it's yeah. great so so but but i love that because here you have maybe the kids that would be you're just towards the arts but right. we're, in a, we're in a stem mm -hmm. school so right. it's logical that right. there should be a strong technology mm -hmm. component, even in the arts, which you mm -hmm. wouldn't typically find. So that that's well, what's that intrigues me. Amazing now with technology is the capability of arts that you can do with technology. It it takes the arts to a whole new level now, where you don't have to just have somebody who's really good with their hand. Mm -hmm. If they just have the creative mind, the technology assistance is is unbelievable. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it all goes down to scientists like Da Vinci, like Steve Jobs. I mean, if you don't know nature, if you don't know art, it's kind of hard to bring that science to the right mm -hmm. place, right, to be used. So it's kind of neat that Right way. now, my students are doing um, drawings and animations in Java. They're having to do shapes and color, you know, just be able to use the geometry mm -hmm. aspect and understand how to do the um, RGB colors and um, manipulate the shapes and how to program them to move around the screen. So, you know, it's, well, that's the begin um, beginning yes. of a game app, you know, at some yes. point, you know, programming that stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've uh, reached the, the end of our time. This has been fun though. It's yeah. learning all this stuff. It's been, I don't, out, it's, it's been out of this world. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I like that answer. I thought we would talk about real pie at some point. But uh, this, this was cool doing this. You know, I appreciate you coming out, Becky. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. I really Thank do. And, 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 and again, we're, we're just glad to know that you're in our schools and not sitting just behind a computer somewhere for a company, but you're actually sitting at your desk in our schools giving our, our children the tools to, to be the future. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so certainly grateful for that. So. And it's been good to see you, Alan. It's been a you while. Too. Good too, that we were able to do this show. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So we'll, we have uh, some 
some other good plans for guests mm -hmm. coming yep. up. And uh, we'll, we'll be doing we'll... this on a regular basis. Absolutely. At least once a month. Yes. And Alan's has some things going on in his life with his kids and stuff. And we'll be interviewing you actually on Peace Recorder's Life at some point. So I can answer the questions. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> at that point. So look forward to, I should say, look forward to Peach Recorder's magazine that's going to be coming out. It's hitting the post office Friday. So it'll be in homes this weekend and through next week. The cover story is 20 under 20. We asked for nominations of kids that people felt should get recognition for a variety of reasons. And we got 35 plus nominations, I believe, and we picked 20. It was tough to pick those 20. Mm -hmm. And we have photo shoots and stuff. And we have stories about them. So that's the eight-page pullout in the center of the magazine that's coming out. We also had uh, several other stories in there, some good, strong features. So pick up the publication if you don't. You should get it in the mail. Every household in the city of Peace Street Corners gets that magazine in the mailbox. But you'll find it at places like Ingalls, Dunkin' Donuts, restaurants, and town center, in a variety of other places, library and stuff. Every school gets it. So uh, look for that. We are launching a new uh, giveaway, too, just so that people know this. Let's go to livinginpeacefreecorners.com on the 25th, and you'll see the weekend staycation giveaway, $1,000 in prizes to stay at home. Well, stay in the city of Peace Recorders anyway and enjoy dinner, maybe a suite at the Hilton, breakfast at First Watch, dinner at Grace 1720. There's a variety of, of, of prizes, so yes. look for that. Yes. Well, again, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Rico. Great to, great to be back with you. Same here. Okay. See you guys. Take care.